Hey everyone, I'm Stephen Pettigrew, I'm the director of the LBJ Urban Lab and faculty at the LBJ School. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, for In the Arena. Uh, COVID-19 has shaped the way Americans live, work, and govern. Communities all over the country are at a standstill and sheltering in place and practicing social distancing. Uh, cities and county leaders have been really the ones that have spearheaded much of our response and in Texas is, is, is no different here. So for this week, looking at this idea of restarting our cities. I'm excited to be joined by an LBJ alum, uh, Judge Sarah Eckhart. Judge, no, welcome. Orange. I got my burnt orange on for this. I see it and it looks great. Uh, you look you look great. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And mo most importantly, thanks for all the, the, the things that you and your staff have been doing tirelessly in these last few weeks. I know it's been, it's been kind of hectic. So thanks for taking a couple of times to, to, to join us. So sure. I want to start with sort of go back a little bit because I think one of the most interesting things for me as we think about how Travis County and particularly the city Austin uh, reacted to the COVID virus was uh, your the collective city's decision and county's decision to cancel South by Southwest. Um, and it was really early um, in the process of when we started looking at public events shutting down. So talk us through that. I mean, I, I think a lot of us have, have looked at this as really sort of this brave demonstration of urban leadership and maybe has really kept our city from being some of an epicenter, like what new, what's happened in New Orleans with Mardi Gras, for instance. So tell us a little bit about that and how that decision came about. Well, we are, um, we're battle tested here in Travis County, having unfortunately lived through um, uh, wildfires, two uh, uh, deadly floods, um, very close, uh, um, close in time. Um, also the bombings, uh, as well as being a, uh, a, a place of refuge for people fleeing from the hurricanes on the coast. So we've, uh, we have a very good emergency response team and also a combined city, county, public health uh, apparatus. And so um, pretty, as well as we're the happy recipients of a medical school, uh, three hospital uh, networks, and a, a very thriving international business community. So the combination of our public health uh, professionals, Dr. Escott and his team, mm -hmm. as well as our um, uh, uh, private hospitals and UT Medical School, combine that with our international business community, there was an early and steady drumbeat leading up to South by Southwest talking about um, uh, whether and when we should pull the plug on South by Southwest. So uh, several of us, actually most of the emergency response team was at a FEMA training at the end of February mm -hmm. um, when this all started to hit. And uh, collectively, uh, we went ahead and launched our emergency operations center as a phase one approach and prepared to be at phase five of community spread um, in the last week of February. Um, so we were, like I said, because we're battle tested and because we have an international business community and a healthcare community that's pretty robust, we were able to base our decision on good medical evidence as well as uh, really good information about what was happening in Southeast Asia and in Europe. And you guys were one of the first public events to really can cancel on this process, right? I mean, and received a little bit of pushback, frankly, right? Knowing that there would be some some economic um, issues that would come up with this, but but it's it seems to me that you all stayed the course on this decision. Then we've stayed the course, and we're attempting to to stick with it because COVID nineteen actually is pretty predictable. We know where this is going. A lot of people don't want to believe where it's going, but we are um, we're seeing what has happened in Asia and what's happened in Europe and even what's happening on the east and west coasts of the United States. And the, the disease is behaving in a fairly predictable way. And so we need to, we need to prepare and respond um, quickly and stay the course in order to um, minimize its effects and be able to bounce back faster. So it seems to me that the city and the county are, are, are really kind of walking and lock and step in this in terms of maybe the decision making process. Tell us a little bit about how maybe the county and the city has worked with the state government or built some coalitions with I know that here in Texas, some many of our private sector leaders have stepped up to the stepped up uh, to the arena as well. well. Talk a little bit about that. 
Sure, actually, the, the city and the county have long been in collaboration. We've uh, achieved a kind of metro government through contractual relationships. Yeah. So um, that's, that's been a long standing uh, activity between um, Travis County and the city of Austin. But also, the city of Austin um, has been reaching out to the other major cities in the state. And, um, and I, as the Travis County judge, um, and also as the chair of the Conference of Urban Counties, has been reaching out to all the major urbanized county judges, um, as well as the surrounding county judges. Mm -hmm. So we have a very good collaboration that covers most of the population centers of the state. Um, where we are all trying to, um, it, you saw it in the shelter in place order, many of the counties and cities within them dropped shelter in place orders within days of one another, yeah. knowing that it was unlikely, uh, uh, it was guidance that was unlikely to come from the state. Yeah, I mean, it, what's been remarkable to me is how our city and county leaders have kind of stepped up and, and really been that coalition that leadership coalition that the state really has needed in the absence of sort of a statewide mandated approach. So uh, kudos to you and to others for, for helping us to, to do that. Um, I want to talk about this question of communication. Um, and that is because you and I were chatting on this before we started was you've got the decision making process and you have this virus that's out there doing what it's doing, although somewhat predictable, as you suggested. But how do you communicate what you all are doing as a governance together to the to the public to sort of tamp down some of public, some of the issues of public fear around this issue. Well, we're you know we're living in an age of social media, which is both a blessing and a curse. Um, we have lots and lots of platforms through which we can pump out really good quality information. Um, but the the downside of that is that there's lots and lots of information. Um, and we do know that a lot of information, even quality information, when people are bombarded by it, it it creates anxiety in itself. And so we, we are, um, uh, those of us who are in a policy making decision uh, uh, role have three things we're dealing with. One is the very real threat of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Another is the, uh, the economic downturn from COVID-19 and the pain that people are experiencing from it. But the third is the panic, which is exhausting for individuals. Um, and is uh, uh, very difficult to manage. So we're trying to put out good quality information, but we're also trying to put out hopeful information that we, um, um, we do know how this virus is going to progress and we are planning and that we all individually have a great deal of power in saving lives and making this, um, this COVID-19 episode uh, shorter and less brutal. Mm -hmm. So as we look to the recovery, you know, let's say eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it may be in, in terms of when we can actually open the city and the county back up, what do you think are the three or four sort of key priorities that we got to be focused on, you know, really laser focused on in terms of, in terms of moving the recovery forward here, here in Travis County? Well, the, the two things that we must be laser focused on right now, um, uh, even though we're, we're not even at the end of the beginning of COVID-19. Yeah. We haven't yet seen the surge uh, in cases in Travis County. Uh, so I wanna manage expectations and also tell folks from an economic stability standpoint, um, we really need to be working together to make sure that we're still circulating money through our economy so that folks uh, can put food on the table, uh, and still have a, a, a sense of economic stability. But we need to do that with the greatest degree of safety. So we're looking for new ways that we can circulate um, uh, money through the economy that doesn't imperil people. One example is, you know, pay your housekeeper for four weeks in advance and tell him or her not to come until later on into the uh, into this episode. Another example is, you know, uh, we know that grocery store workers are frontline yeah. um, and we're very concerned for their health. Um, call in your order to grocery stores and do curbside pickup in order to increase safety in the work site. Um, these are the sorts of things we, we're finding new ways to, um, to show the love uh, by keeping our distance. Yeah, and you think this idea of keeping a distance is going to be something that we're going to be dealing with maybe uh, throughout the summer, even even, even as we look, to, it look towards the summer and the fall, this question of trying to maintain distance is going to be something that we think about? Absolutely. 
I think that this is, uh, this is a, new, uh, a new thing for us, but I think that it's going to be with us for some time. We're gonna have to find new ways and safer ways, and there's going to be some, some unintended dividend from this. There are many types of work sites that really could benefit from uh, greater digitization, uh, the ability to go virtual, um, it's going to open up lots of job opportunities for folks that um, uh, might not have otherwise been available to them. Ways of working that increase the capacity of our transportation infrastructure. Um, also, ways of working that increase the safety and resiliency of our workforce in the construction industry, for instance. Yeah, I think the thing that is uh, that I've uh, that I have really thought that's been pretty amazing here in Austin and Travis County is is how innovative our some of our small businesses have been, particularly restaurants and delivery service. Uh, the idea of, of of delivery of margaritas, right? I mean, that is something that that, uh, that is kind of an interesting, uh, very innovative approach to thinking about how we how we sort of help many of these enterprises keep their keep the lights on. Let me let me close our, our, our quick conversation today with, with one, question, one other question, and that is this, this relationship between um, states and cities. And as you know, I, I, I've been saying that I'm a born again Texan again, coming back after being away for many years. And one of the things that's always, uh, that is, is interesting to me is that a little bit of that adversarial relationship between the state and the, and the counties and cities here and for such a long time, you know, it is this, it has been this, the, the, the mantra of the state to sort of take power away from cities and communities. Um, but man, it has been our cities and our county leaders that have been on the front lines of this in terms of this response and have really read the way. And as, and as, as we look to the recovery, what's your thoughts on this relationship between how recovery happens? Is it, is it led by city and county officials supported by the state or is it state led? What's your take on that? Well, the, the emergency response is most definitely led at the local level. Um, uh, the, the state definitely leads from behind. Uh, um, I, I, I think the evidence is, is clear on that point. Um, the, I suppose the benefits, to the extent that there are benefits of, of leading from behind, is that you get um, multiple local level experiments in what uh, is is the best approach. Mm -hmm. But I think that in something like a pandemic, obviously the best approach is a comprehensive one. Sure. Um, uh, there are certain sorts of emergencies that you could describe as, as unique from a local perspective, but a pandemic is not one of yeah. them. Um, so yes, it's, it, it cannot be expected that a policymaking body that meets only every other year uh, could possibly um, be the, the leader on um, emergency response. It's simply not nimble enough. Mm -hmm. um, so local government is, is the leader in these circumstances. What about the recovery piece? Do you think that the, the recovery, when I mean recovery, the economic recovery, the economic development, the workforce development, from your perspective, is, is that, will that be city-led? Should it be city-led? Is there a role for how the city and the state should work together on that? Um, it would be obviously preferable if the city and the state, if the locals and the state worked together on the economic stabilization and the economic recovery. Um, the, the history is not good on that. Um, the, the history is that the local governments uh, create the stabilization because we have no social safety net at the state level uh, and apparently not much interest in a social safety net at the state level. Um, and then the state dabbles in uh, the improvement of the business environment for those who already have a pretty darn good business environment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things I think we can all hope for is that as when the legislature comes back uh, together in uh, 2021, that maybe this question of a safety net for some of our uh, essential workers, people that we've deemed essentials, you know, our grocery store pickers, those types of things. Yeah, um, healthcare workers will get that get those support systems that we hopefully can provide to them. Sort of in a, a really frankly something they deserve, but also a thank you for for really putting themselves at risk. Um, well, I'll tell you the the healthcare um, circumstance and the construction circumstance statewide. This pandemic has been like a die trace through a system showing massive gaps, absolutely massive. Um, uninsured people are going to, uh, um, they're going to be, um, 
I, I hate to sound so dramatic, but I don't think I'm being overly dramatic. People will die because they are uninsured. And we have a tremendous number of uninsured. Even in wealthy Travis County, 19% of the population is uninsured. Yeah. Um, and then with regard to the construction industry, I know the construction industry is, is begging to be able to continue, uh, even under our shelter in place. But since so many of the workers in the construction industry um, are considered contractors and don't have insurance and don't have, um, um, uh, they, they don't have uh, unemployment insurance and whatnot, yeah because they are living at such thin margins and it is a deadly industry even on a good day, um, it's, it's hard to say yes to continuing a construction industry where we know that will mean more people will be exposed to COVID-19 and more people will die. Which, which really raises this question of, of, of public health and public health safety nets that, that this state has not put at the forefront, that we need to put, in front for, uh, put at the top of our agenda if we wanna make sure that we're sort of thinking about the resiliency, right? I mean, this is, the state of Texas has been a place that has thought about natural disaster resiliency a lot, but mm -hmm. this, is, this is a bit new charted territory for us, perhaps. Well, we're more resilient if in blue sky times, um, people have margins to fall back on in dark sky times. And we are, as a state, do not put much investment in making sure that each Texan has a little bit of margin. Um, so we, we really are struggling in that regard. Um, um, this pandemic has really highlighted how, how interrelated we are, mm -hmm. that the, the, no matter how wealthy and how much of a margin you think that you have, if those without margin are put at this kind of risk, all of us are put at this kind of risk. Yeah, uh, sure. COVID-19 doesn't care how much money you got in the bank. Well, Judge, thank you for joining us today, taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, much appreciated. And I know our, um, our LBJ alumni appreciate you as well. I really appreciate you reaching out. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.